Hello and good evening everyone. My name is Noah Steinorth. I'm a senior here at Hope College, a third year member of Markets and Morality, and have been privileged with the opportunity to introduce our speaker today. I want to thank you all for coming out tonight, and I would also like to thank our co-sponsors, the Political Science Department and the Department of Business and Economics. If you do not know what Markets and Morality is, that might be understandable. We're a tight group of stu students with broad interests, and our 15 students this year is the largest we'll go. Because at its core, m and is a book club concerned with the flourishing of humanity and the supplementation of the liberal arts education. Though we are small in number, we do really big things, including ho hosting excellent speakers and important discussions here on campus, doing what we can in ensuring Hope College is a solid learning environment for those curious and courageous enough to learn and think broadly. Tonight, we will begin with a lecture from our visiting speaker, but we will also leave plenty of time afterwards for questions. It is now my pleasure and privilege to introduce and welcome back our speaker, Dr. P.J. Hill. Dr. Hill grew up on a cattle farm, a cattle ranch in eastern Montana, which he operated with his family until 1992. He earned his PhD in economics from the University of Chicago, and Dr. Hill served as the George F. Bennett Professor of Economics and also as a Professor of Econom Economics Emeritus at Wheaton College for 25 years, where he retired in 2011. He has, has co-authored a number of books, including Growth and Welfare in the American Past, The Birth of a Transfer Society, and The Not-So-Wild Wild West property rights on the frontier. He is currently serving as a senior fellow at the Property and Environment Research Center in Bozeman, Montana, where I recently had the opportunity to visit. In my time at the Property and Environment Research Center, I was able to see the beauty of Yellowstone National Park just a short drive away, and was also able to see what a property rights approach to environmentalism looks like. It was an absolute privilege as it is now for me to welcome our speaker tonight. Will you all please join me in welcoming our much esteemed speaker, Dr. P.J. Hill. Thanks, Noah. Make you go off the other way. So I'm starting to feel like a regular here, so I come back on the fairly often, but it's a delight to be uh, back here again. I think I've got a clicker here someplace. So the title, Why We Are Failing Liberalism, The Promises and Perils of Coercion, in a sense that is, if you haven't noticed, it's a takeoff on Patrick Deneen's book, Why Liberalism is uh, Failed or is Failing. Uh, and I'm going to take a little different perspective. I'm going to say that it's not failing, but we may be failing it. So I'm going to talk about the modern, I'm going to talk about liberalism. Now, when I say liberalism, be clear that I don't mean it in kind of the 21st century um, US sense in which we think of as a liberal as a person on the left as opposed to a conservative on the right. Um, it's really classical liberalism or liberalism as a, as a way of organizing society. We can call it the modern liberal order, perhaps a better term for it. Uh, and one of the things about the modern liberal order, the fundamental thing about it is built upon an ideology or uh, an ethos or an ethic, and it's built to protect basic human dignity of all people. That's really what distinguishes it as a political order. Does it do it perfectly? No. Uh, does it sometimes need to be modified to do it? Uh, yes. One of the things about it, of course, it does allow people uh, who differ in many ways to live together in relative peace. And so that's a good sort of a thing about allowing people uh, of differing ideologies, different perspectives, uh, different lifestyles to be able to figure out a way uh, to live together. Uh, it does depend heavily upon the rule of law, uh, which is basically equality before the law, substantive rules that apply equally to all of the people uh, in the society. And if you want to, we can talk more about uh, 
what that particularly means. I'm going to focus a lot on coercion in this talk. And the thing about the modern liberal order um, is that it does use coercion. It has a very clear, very specific way uh, to use uh, coercion. Uh, and so it is a coercive society. It's important to recognize that it is a coercive society. I should probably tell you what I mean by coercion. It's basically the practice of persuading something to, somebody to do something that they wouldn't ordinarily do. It's usually, usually done by force or the threat of force. Uh, sometimes people talk about coercion as a decrease in your opportunity set, a decrease in the things you can do. That's not a particularly useful definition for what I want to talk about the use of coercion here. Uh, lots of things happen to your opportunities. Uh, you may be dating someone and you think you've got a pretty good relationship going and a competitor comes along and wins away your affection. Your opportunity set has decreased. I don't call that coercion. I call that competition, but that's not coercion. You may own a small restaurant in Holland, and uh, McDonald's move, moves in five blocks away, and you have fewer customers. Um, that's not coercion. Now, if the owner of McDonald's starts pouring glue in the locks of all of the cars in your parking lot, or firebombing your place, then that's coercion. But that's not coercion uh, to do these other sorts of things. So I have a, I have a particular view of coercion. And we're going to talk about what I'm going to call the modern liberal order here. The thing about the modern liberal order is it does have a very strong focus on what I would call negative rights or negative liberty, uh, meaning that its main, main function of coercion is to prevent people from harming you. It does not have a terribly strong positive vision of the things that you're supposed to be doing with your life. Uh, it may be articulated, but it's not particularly uh, coerced. The nice thing about it, it is a relatively clear standard, because you can say, are somebody's rights uh, being violated by, a, by some uh, particular action? Uh, in fact, uh, one person has said it's really the, the, the rules for the modern liberal order are don't hit other people, don't take their stuff, keep your promises. Now, with the keep your promises things, we have certain conditions that we have to fulfill before we enforce the contract. But we use coercion to keep people from hitting other people. We have coercion to keep people from taking other people's stuff. And we use coercion to make people keep their promises. So the nice thing about that is it is a pretty clear order. So for the use of coercion, you know how to use it. However, in most of the modern liberal orders that we see, and I'll give you some historical context here for the modern liberal order, uh, we do a few other things, too, uh, besides uh, keeping you from hitting people and taking their stuff. There's something called public goods. It's something that e economists talk about, uh, things that where the transaction costs are difficult to force everybody to pay for, or when something is produced, some of the people can benefit from it without having to pay for it. So one of the standard ones there uh, is um, national defense. So if John Lund decides to hire uh, somebody to defend uh, his house against missile attacks from the Canadians, uh, it so happens that Sarah Estelle can, uh, can free ride on that. How do we solve that problem? We say, you all have to contribute. So for certain goods, we say, we're going to use the taxation system to force people to contribute. Roads, police force, uh, national defense, a lot of sorts of things can fall in that context. Generally, with the modern liberal order, we do say that the public goods concept is limited. I mean, you can't put everything in there. There's still a big, what we would call the private sector. So there's, there's that, that we're adding to the negative liberties or the negative rights. And then almost all modern liberal orders say, we're going, we need to care for the poor. You can put this in the public goods thing. It actually fits there or maybe just general concern that we would like to care for people who are disadvantaged, um, maybe through a fault of their own or maybe through no fault of their own. And the, the presupposition is that, the, that people care for each other voluntarily, 
but that's inadequate for the society. So we will use the tax, tax system to actually do some care for people. Uh, again, we say some. We don't think that we generally modern liberal orders don't say we're taking on the responsibility for the uh, economic or physical well-being of all people in the society. Um, and there are, so you know, even there, there are some issues um, that um, primary issues that uh, don't go with the modern, uh, you know, um, that don't fit with the modern liberal order. But that's kind of our modern liberal order. But now, when I was putting up my first slide, I said it's a pretty clear standard. What's happened to my standard? <laughs> it's become somewhat fuzzier, hasn't it? Once we start talking about public goods, why don't we talk about care for the poor, it is much harder to figure out you know, where we want to draw those lines. What we're really talking about is what's the appropriate use of coercion? Because in the modern liberal order, there is a very clear concept of coercion, making people to do things that they might not otherwise want to do, and using threat of uh, using force or the threat of force to try to get it done. Now, it does mean that even in our modern liberal order, we have not resolved all of the society, all, all of the questions of um, you know who counts the whole issue. We've had to go through uh, issues of. Uh, of race, of sex, those sorts of things with regard to it. And we're facing an issue right now that has not been resolved in the American context uh, in terms of the modern liberal order, and that's the issue of abortion. You know, there's a question, you know, whose rights uh, are going to be protected coercively? Is it the right of the mother? Is it the right of the unborn child? I happen to come down quite strongly on the side of the unborn child, but that's Another whole topic, not the topic um, that we're, we're taking up here. So this is the modern liberal order. It is the use of coercion. It is the use of, the co of coercion in a very particular targeted way with its primary, um, primary uh, function to be to protect all people. And that's, that, by the way, that's a, an unusual sort of ideology because if you go back a thousand years or uh, 500 years, it's not generally accepted by everybody in all societies, by in fact lots of societies, that the idea of universal human dignity is a pretty unusual one. So now let's do a little bit of history. I'm going to argue that the beginnings of the modern liberal order, and this comes from a whole group of uh, historians, uh, intellectual historians, economic historians, would say that the modern liberal order really starts around 1780 to 1825. Now, historians like to quibble about exact dates, and it's not clear exactly what that date is, but there's a, a whole... Um, there's some people that just disagree entirely with that, but there is a whole group of people that say, would say there is a different sort of an order for structuring society and structuring the use of coercion, and with the primary function of coercion being to, to respect uh, and defend um, prim you know, universal human dignity, human agency, uh, the, the well-being uh, of all people. So. We think that it starts in the Netherlands and England. Netherlands actually may be before 1750. Uh, it uh, comes to North America. Uh, it comes to, uh, throughout the 19th century. It becomes a, a major way of governing societies in Western Europe. And then after that, we get what we would think of the modern liberal order in countries like Japan, uh, Hong Kong, Singapore. Uh, some people have argued that Botswana uh, is pretty close to a modern liberal order. Chile in Latin America, um, they're having some constitutional sorts of issues right now, uh, but they uh, <coughs> would have been a country that we would say uh, is or is close to the modern liberal order. That raises an interesting question, though. If this is the modern liberal order, the whatabouts, and here's a couple of whatabouts. So I'm saying it starts in 1800. It starts in you know, Western Europe. It's in the US. But weren't those societies holding slaves? You know, wasn't slavery a part of their way of doing it? What about indigenous people? Because some of these countries that we would claim are modern liberal orders are also some of the major colonial powers that have not a very enviable track record in terms of treating indigenous people. And that is an issue. That is an embarrassment. But 
Let's look at the history of the emancipation of slavery. I'm going to take you through about a little over a hundred year period. It's called the Chronology of Emancipation. This actually comes from a book on slavery by Bob Fogel uh, and Stan Engerman, Time on the Cross. Uh, and so here's what happens over 100 years because of liberal, ide uh, liberal ideology, liberal or the classical liberal thinking about people. Uh, in 1772, uh, Chief Justice in England rules that slavery is not supported by English law. 1774, an English Society of Friends says, boy, we care deeply about this, and you can't be in the slave trade and be in our uh, society. Uh, actually, a country, Madeira, which is a small country, kind of almost surrounded by Portugal, they actually abolished slavery. 1776, the Society of Friends in England um, uh, and in Pennsylvania, they both vote the expulsion uh, uh, of any member engaged in the slave trade. 1777, the Vermont Constitution uh, uh, outlawed slavery. I apologize for the fact the type is different here. I want to paste the uh, document in, and the type was too small, so I typed it in. So that's two things. Type script is different on different pages, and there may be mistakes. But... Uh, so 1780, Massachusetts Constitution declares all men are free. Pennsylvania adopts a policy of gradual emancipation. Interesting enough, emancipation in many of these places is gradual to start with. You, you, you don't emancipate all of the slaves immediately. You do them at some age, you know, maybe at 21, or, some, or sometimes it's only the children of, of existing slaves. So it's, it happens, but it's not instantaneous and all of these sorts of things. Uh, 1784, Rhode Island and Connecticut. Uh, you get the Society for the Abolition of the Slave Trade in England. Um, 1794, France actually bans slavery, uh, but Napoleon repeals that. Uh, 1799, New York, gradual emancipation again. Uh, 1800, uh, U.S. citizens are barred from exporting slavery. 1804, slavery is abolished in a bunch of states and countries. 1807, uh, this is a biggie. England and the U.S. prohibit engagement in international slave trade. Um, Argentina, gradual emancipation, uh, 1820. This is pretty important because England is the major naval power in the world, and they start actually not really caring about sovereign nations here. They'll stop ships, slave ships, and say, you can't do that. Take them away. It's a pretty messy sort of a process, but that's important. Uh, in Chile, it's abolished in 1823, 1824, abolished in Central America. Mexico, 1831 in Bolivia. Um, 1838, it's abolished in all slave British colonies. Important treaty in 1841, uh, four major countries, England, France, Prussia, and Aust Austria, agree to search vessels on the high seas. Again, kind of outside of the domain of your sovereignty, but willing to do that. Uh, 1842, it's abolished in Uruguay. Uh, 1848, in French and Danish, Danish colonies uh, in Ecuador. It's abolished in Peru and Venezuela in 1854. 1862, slave trade ends in Cuba. 1863, in all Dutch colonies. Um, and then, of course, finally, and it's maybe embarrassment to say finally, but in 1865, slavery is abolished in the U.S. after the Civil War with the passage of the 13th Amendment. Uh, you get gradual eman emancipation in Brazil in 1871, um, abolished in Puerto Rico in 1873, 1886, it's abolished in Cuba, and then finally it was gradual emancipation earlier, but in 1888 it's abolished in Brazil. Now, that doesn't mean slavery is actually ended in the world. Uh, International Justice Mission estimates there's between 40 and 50 million people still held in slavery. But there's almost no intellectual or legal arguments for slavery. Um, no country says, you know, it is legal to hold slaves. Now, sometimes they don't enforce the laws dramatically. But remember, this is 100 years in which, basically, the modern uh, liberal order ideology ends a pernicious institution. So that's a dramatic change, and it would be nice if it could have been, you know, uh, a little quicker, a little sooner. And there's still some, you know, some heritage there that uh, has some 
you know, terrible sorts of consequences. But I would argue that it is the ideology of universal human dignity, of human agency, um, of the imago Dei, of all people made in the image of God, that does then result in this permanent institution. Up until then, nobody thought much about, and there's some arguments. You can find some Christian uh, scholars that argue against slavery. There's a few other people that do, but it, almost nobody thinks that you're ever going to end it because it's just been a fact of life for you conquer a society, you enslave the people. I mean, this was something that people did for time, for a long time. Okay, I'm going to talk about an unexpected benefit. I've lectured before, here before. Uh, I'm going to call it unexpected because it is substantial economic growth, and it is kind of unexpected. You can look back to the architects of the modern liberal order, and you say, look at John Locke, uh, Montesquieu, uh, Hobbes, um, Rousseau, although he had some interesting ideas about um, human capability and getting, uh, you know, getting human institutions out of the way. Um, you look at you know, all of these people that were part of the intellectual revolution that led to the modern liberal order. There's not much about them. Even Adam Smith, I would argue, is one of those. He doesn't talk much about substantial economic growth. Adam Smith does think a lot about economics and why it's going to free up a certain amount of entrepreneurial activity and uh, why the making of pins would be a little more done a little better in a society of prices and property rights. But this substantial economic growth, I would say, is I may mean, call it a secondary benefit or. If you're an economics major, maybe you want to make it a primary benefit, but it, it is a benefit. I would argue it is a benefit. But if you go back to the writings, the way of thinking about the political social order, you don't see that as a, a, you know, a substantial sort of an argument in the 1600s and the 1700s. But we do get, uh, this is the numbers that, uh, that I would ascribe to the modern liberal order. Uh, varies across country, across time. But uh, the best numbers that I know would be that per capita income, which is per person, measuring in that way, in real terms, some issues about how you do it in real terms, but it's a, that means there's about a 1.6% annual increase in real per capita income. That doesn't seem like much, does it? 1.6%. So you're 1.6% better off this year than you were last year. Well, isn't that not dramatic? That does mean that it doubles per capita income doubles every 43 years. So in your lifetime, it'll double, and then it will, for most of you, will double again. So that is a dramatic uh, change. And it does mean that most of these countries have been, uh, we're looking at for modern liberal orders, are around 150 to 230 years. So that is dramatic. So. I will give you one graph, the only graph. I'm an economist, so I've got to give you one. Um, but this is, any, probably, any of you in economics courses have seen what we call the hockey stick graph, which is the handle uh, of the graph is a long horizontal line and the blade is a turn up. So this is the same graph. This one happens to come from Gregory Clark, uh, uh, his book, Farewell to Alms. And in his book, the nice thing about his book is he takes income per person on the vertical axis, and he makes it one uh, because he's using the unit of one as income per person in 1800. So that's our standard in 1800. Uh, most of the others, uh, they've got the uh, income per person line right, so just almost uh, coincident with the horizontal axis. So we're looking at time on the horizontal axis, and we're looking at income per person on the vertical axis, and the unit one is the world in 1800. Okay, so, and uh, Clark thinks you can go back, and other, you know, historians have tried to do this, go back to, um, you know, 1000 BC, and at that point we're talking about looking at, you know, skeletal remains, those sorts of things. Um, so it's down a little bit below the world average, and then it's back up above, and then it's back down, about the time of Christ, it's right at it. Uh, next 500 years, it's hopping around it again, another 500 years above it for a period of time, back down for a period of time. Up to 1500, about the same. Year 1800, about the same. Now, it doesn't mean there isn't wealth. This is the wealth of the ordinary person. These are the, the regular day-to-day -day people in the society. What does that mean? Well, it means you can take a person in the year 1500 and put them back to 500. Take them back, put them back 1,000 years. 
What's it look like? Well, there would be, depending on the region of the world, there might be some variety in terms of foodstuffs that you could consume or you know, building stuff you use for your house. But a person in 1500 can go back a 1,000 years and say, boy, life is just about the same. You can take a person from the time of Christ and put them up 500 years, put them up 1,000 years, put them up 1,500 years, and the life of the ordinary person is the same. Now, there's rise and fall of people that are wealthy. There's great architecture. There's music. There's literature. So it's not that there's nothing happening, but economically, the life of the ordinary person doesn't change for a couple thousand years. Then we get the economic effect of the modern liberal order, which is a system of coercion, coercion based upon a moral concept, the universal dignity of all people, which then means you define and enforce property rights uh, for, for people. And uh, Gregory Clark actually gives us some labels here. He says this first several thousand years is the Malthusian trap. Uh, that's a pretty good term. Thomas Malthus, an English clergyman writing uh, both before and after. Before 1800, he was, he was publishing anonymously. Afterwards, he was putting his name on his writings. But he said, you're not going to get economic growth. Uh, and actually, when he was writing in, in describing history, he was correct. He wasn't correct in terms of the future. Clark calls this the Industrial Revolution. Um, that's OK, because there's a lot of technological change. But what's really driving thing is, things is an institutional revolution. So I would use the term institutional revolution uh, for what happened, again, around 1800, um, England and the Netherlands, North America, Western Europe, then some other parts uh, of the world. Um, and then he does call this the great divergence. And that is interesting. Those of you who are from other countries or who have traveled in other countries know that that's pretty obvious. You know, in um, around 1800, the wealthiest countries had per capita incomes about three times that uh, of the poorest countries. And that's, just, that's the difference. However, what is it today? Somewhere between, and there's a lot of questions about you know, what you use for the purchasing power parity, but it's somewhere between 25 and 50 times uh, as the difference in, in per capita income uh, across countries. And so you know, many of you are aware of that. You've traveled where you walk down the street, and you just see it. And so that's a dramatic uh, sort of a change uh, in the world, and that's a part of the modern liberal order. As I said, it, it was an unexpected benefit. I don't even think it's the primary benefit, but it's a nice one to be living uh, on this side of it. How do I think about that period of time? Well, I would characterize this when that, with that massive increase. So the, the hockey stick, the, the blade of the hockey stick is that part that turns up, and the handle is the long uh, period of... Uh, no substantial changes in per capita income. I'd call it massive cooperation. People are cooperating across time and space in ways that they couldn't cooperate before or that they didn't cooperate. Now, there's always been long distance trade. There's the Silk Road. Uh, you know, there's trade within the Byzantine Empire. Uh, uh, on the Roman Empire, there was a lot of trade around the Mediterranean. But there's, the cooperation just exists over among so many more people. And for one thing, it makes technological change more feasible. There's the exchange of ideas. It becomes worthwhile to think about uh, mechanizing certain processes. Uh, and what does it mean? It means there's lots more violent or lots, lots more voluntary trades uh, between people. So you know, that's what's going on. And one of the interesting things that I actually think introduces certain issues of analysis is a positive sum world. So you look at interactions between people in this world of trade, and both parties, you know, both parties are better off. If you think of the world in a zero-sum terms, and that was the appropriate way to think about most human interactions, as well, somebody got better off, somebody, you know. Uh, or, or negative, somebody got nobody, and that had to be offset by somebody else's loss. And perhaps it was negative some, because after we fought the war, uh, people were really worse off, or after uh, you know, the power took over another country. But if the world is positive some, your whole method of thinking about human interaction changes, because then you think about, 
Well, how do people cooperate? And then the big question is, of course, what are the rules that would lead to this massive cooperation? And a, um, certainly a cottage industry in history now, particularly economic history, are, is people writing about that change. Uh, Darren Osamoglu, MIT economist, James Robinson, uh, political scientists have got a couple of books out uh, about uh, you know, uh, the change. Deirdre McCloskey, very, thought McCloskey, very thoughtful person, has three volumes, uh, Bourgeois Dignity, Bourgeois Ethics, Bourgeois Virtue. That isn't the necessarily order that they come in. Joan Mulcair, uh, Northwestern economic historian, has three books on this change. Uh, I'm going to take up a particular one. It's Violence and Social Orders. And the authors are uh, Doug North, uh, John Wallace, and Barry Weingast. And you may not be able to read uh, the small print there. Uh, Doug, John, and Barry are uh, not noted for their humility. But they say, a conceptual framework for interpreting recorded human history. So we're going to reinterpret all of recorded human history. But I actually think that it, uh, ha there is something to that. And I'm going to use this to talk about the modern liberal order, that substantial change in how we governed, uh, how, first of all, there were not really the concept of sovereign nations. There were empires. But we do get the concept of sovereign nations. And the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648 is one of the things that kind of gives you the, the basis uh, for um, these nations. Um, but North Wallace and I, Weingast would say the world is governed by something we're going to call the natural state. They're calling it the natural state because they say this is the way societies govern themselves. And then they almost all have some sort of use of coercion to help people to do what they want. There's, they also call it the limited access order because one of the characteristics of the limit of, the, of this order is that uh, it's, the access is limited. Fundamental ideological precept of the natural state or the limited access order, a pervasive sense that not all individuals were created or are equal. That wording has always bothered me. I would put another equal in there, but I'm copying it directly out of their book. So, so they would say a pervasive sense. I mean, societies throughout history have said either on the basis of ethnicity, race, oftentimes sex, but people aren't equal. You know. And, just been a fundamental fact of the way the worlds have been organized. In that case, that means that there is a dominant coalition uh, whose members possess special privileges. Dominant coalition varies across time and space. Sometimes it's a religious elite. Sometimes it's an economic elite. Sometimes it's a military elite. But there is some group that gets special access. Why? Because not everybody's equal, and they're more equal than the other. So they usually claim the levers of power. It is, in this sort of a situation, one in which for, um, personal relationships are really important because they're the basis for social organization. Now, given the fact that not everybody's treated equally and given that coercive power is used to enforce this unequal treatment, why do people allow it to happen? Why are most of these orders throughout history? And they would say it's typical of all social orders throughout, once you move out of the very small tribal societies, and they don't write much about that. Well, it exists because it controls violence. Order is better than disorder. And even if the, prima, or, you know, the primary ruler is taking 30% of your crops, that may be better than having Mansur Olson um, uh, Economist who has written about the difference between stationary bandits uh, and roving bandits. And you want, you want stationary bandits because they would like for you to produce food this year on your little plot of land, and they would like for you to produce it next year, and they would like for you to produce it the year after. So they're not going to take in everything. Roving bandits are the ones you don't want because they don't care. They're not coming back for another couple of decades, so they'll take everything. So. You're willing to have stationary bandits in this world, and sometimes you don't have a lot of other ways to, power, to do anything about it. So what they argue, though, is, again, the world changes. And it changes for part of the world, only for part of it. Changes around 1800. They call it the open access order. Okay? 
I'm using the term modern liberal order. What's distinctive about its belief structure? A widely set, uh, held set of beliefs about the inclusion of and equality for all citizens. So, universal human dignity. Put perfectly into place by all of these open access to orders? No, but you always have a moral complaint if it doesn't happen. You can go and say, look, here I'm not being treated equally, or that group of people is not being treated equally. And I think that's the driving force of that 100 years of emancipation, of getting rid of this institution that had existed from time immemorial, people enslaving other people. That's just a, when you think about it historically, a very unusual circumstance in after several thousand years of people enslaving other people, whether they had the power or some sort of moral suasion or something to do it, it ends. And it's pretty hard to defend now. You don't find hardly anybody in intellectual circles that goes around saying, well, yeah, I think we should enslave some people. Um, so what this widely set held a belief, set of beliefs, that means that you can produce, you can be in community, you can do all sorts of things, entry into economic, political, religious, and educational activities without constraint. Um, Support for different organizational forms. That means you're going to enforce contracts. Um, and of course, this is carried out by the rule of law, which basically means the legal system, the rules, apply impartially for all citizens. And one of the things that comes out of that is because of the rule of law, you'll get much more impersonal exchange among people that you don't know. And that takes another whole set of uh, moral understandings and uh, legal rules. So that's where we're at at this point. Now I want to take up some critics of them. I don't, maybe they're not critics as far as you're concerned, but I have to have something to think about in my retirement, so I think about uh, the critics. And I want to take up a group of people that they, they would call themselves conservatives, and in a very real sense they are. They've just issued something called uh, the National, Conser National Conservatism, a state of principles, and 83 of them have signed onto that. That's about a month old. Uh, they would label themselves as uh, common good conservatives or the new right. Uh, and so I'm going to take up some of them because they are very thoughtful uh, people talking about our social order. One of them, is, of course, is Patrick Deneen. This is his second book. I'll come back to his first book, but I apologize to Patrick for not getting his full name on there when I uh, pasted in the uh, cover of the book. But just the, his second book, which just came out this year called Regime Change, does a pretty good job of summarizing these concerns. There's a whole set of concerns by the new conservatives or the common good conservatives. Uh, and th this, is, uh, this is what they are. Uh, the social, uh, on the social and political side, uh, breakdown in family stability, deaths of despair, a recent reduction in years of life expectancy, uh, declining levels of participation in civic institutions, increased loneliness, wanting experience of friendships. Now, in a sense, so Deneen is speaking for, and I think fairly accurately, for a whole group of people for whom this is a major concern. Okay, so this is what they're saying. So I, I took this quote out because this is the one that I found that kind of best captures the thinking of this whole group of people. Actually, interestingly enough, those are my concerns. You know, I, a lot of those I identify with. So in that sense, uh, I'm right with them. His first book, Why Liberalism Failed, um, now, you read, if you read Why Liberalism Failed, it's an interesting experience because he's very articulate, gives you all sorts of uh, concerns about why liberalism isn't working. And what he means by liberalism is the modern liberal project, the modern liberal order um, that I talked about as starting in 1800 and having certain particular characteristics. Um, and in that one, when you finish the book, um, he basically says, uh, well, there is a need for uh, alternative communities and new, um, and new cultures. And so you wonder, so Patrick, you wrote this whole book, and I guess we're supposed to go live in some intentional community. And I mean, at that point, you think, well, 
I just spent several hours going through your book, and I could form a community. And there have been lots of them. Um, what happened here that I didn't, uh, so I got ahead of myself. Um, so anyway, uh, that's, so if we, oops, now I'm going the wrong way. Um, ah. I, I, want, I want to go back. OK. Well, my left arrow and my right arrow are not always the same. I know I can do it on my computer. So, um, so anyway, he says, the need for alternative communities. Well, actually, when you go to his next book, uh, which the book I gave the, the quote to you from, uh, Regime Change, in that one, he is uh, more explicit uh, that there is an alternative. Uh, the only genuine alternative to liberalism's commitment uh, to a world of globalized indifference is one of, the, one of the common good that is secured with the assistance and support of our shared common order, the political order. So what I want to argue is that the new right or the uh, common good conservatives uh, basically have a different view of co coercion. It's, it's a expanded view, of course. Now, people on the left for a long time have had that. But this is kind of, I would say, is a, a, a fairly recent development. Um, one of the other books, uh, Adrian Vermeulen, very articulate Harvard Law professor, uh, uh, he calls it common good constitutionalism rather than common good uh, conservatism. Um, but he says these libertarian conceptions of property rights and economic rights will have to go insofar as they bar the state, again, we're talking about coercive power, the bar the state from enforcing duties of community and solidarity in the use and distribution of resources. So another, uh, another view in terms of coercion and how we should use it. By the way, the people that I'm talking about here is what I would call, they are public intellectuals. I've gone to their books to try to figure out as precisely as I could what they say. They're on YouTube. If you want to look them up, Google their name, and you'll see them doing speeches, interviews, panels, uh, all of those sorts of things. Uh, Oren Cass, uh, another one that uh, uh, argues about. Now, he's much more concerned about uh, the labor market. Uh, and he says, we need a labor market in which workers can support strong families and communities. That should be the central determinant of long-term prosperity and should be the central focus of public policy. Again, that's an expanded view of what's, uh, you know, what the liberal order should be doing. So Amari, um, perhaps famous, first of all, where he debated David French uh, before uh, the, before uh, the, six, the 2016 election. And he is critical. He says that, that basically the problem is we have this systematic attempt to foreclose the very possibility of ordinary people using political power and workplace pressure to get a fair shake out of the economy. In other words, you need political power and workplace pressure, and the modern liberal order is standing in the way of that. Um, R.R. Reno, Rusty Reno, uh, editor of First Things, uh, also one of the authors of this statement last uh, month on the new conservatives, uh, uh, certainly a, a leading uh, political figure uh, in uh, the order. Uh, there is a think tank called um, Oh, but there is, yeah, there is a, uh, uh, a podcast called The uh, Post-Liberal Order. I was listening to it day before yesterday. Uh, you have to pay to subscribe to it, which I wasn't excited about doing, but I decided if I was going to give this lecture, I better find out what they were talking about. So I do pay $60 a year to listen to the, the term post-liberal is now the term that is used. It's not hyphenated. It's one word, post-liberal, the order that follows liberalism. Uh, so Patrick Deneen is on there, along with uh, Gladden Papen, Hungarian Institute of International Affairs. Many of the new conservatives are, think that maybe Hungary has got it right this time. And so there's uh, Rod Dreher has actually moved to Hungary and uh, had several different uh, positions there. Chad Pecknold, Catholic University of America. There's a think tank called American Compass. Um, their statement on their think tank, they, they say they are, I mean, they're very clear. They're not part of the left. They're, you know, they're part of the right. They would say conservatives now realize that economics needs politics 
to define the ends that markets should advance. Previously, in a sense, people defined their ends within the context of not violating other people's rights. So this is an expansion, and policymakers should be responsive to their constituents. American Compass has a handbook called Rebuilding American Capitalism. Again, the tiny print says a handbook uh, for conservative policymakers, and here's some of the things that they're arguing. Uh, Policymakers should create demand for domestic manufacturing. They should channel investment to national priorities. They should eliminate the trade deficit. They should enforce legal constraints uh, of the supply of low-wage labor. Make all jobs ones that Americans will do. Well, again, look at the verbs that are there. Create, uh, channel, eliminate. Uh, enforce, make. Those are all statements of expanded coercion. Now, you may agree or disagree with it, but we should be clear that we're thinking about using coercion in uh, an expanded sort of a way. What's my problem? <laughs> Why am I traveling to Hope College and spending an evening with you talking about this little tiny thing of, oh, they want to expand coercion a little bit. So what? Well, I would say there are two big problems. Uh, with it. I'll give you actually, it kind of flows into a third. There's the measurement problem and the monitoring problem. If you are expanding coercion, you need to measure how successful you are. You need to monitor that coercion and figure out, okay, what are your goals? So you're going to strengthen the family. So after 10 years of doing it, how are you measuring if you've strengthened the family? Uh, you've refocused the emphasis on tradition. Uh, you've honored the worker in the workplace. Those require, if you're going to use coercion and evaluate that coercion, uh, you actually need to figure out, um, okay, how are we doing uh, in it? I find one of the fascinating things as I look at the new conservatives is throughout all of their writings is what I would call an anti-elitism. They're very concerned that the people in charge of the universities the people in charge of the government, the people in charge of the think tanks, uh, the not-for-profits, and the people in charge of the business community are all their enemies. So let's extend coercion, and lo and behold, those people won't be in charge. And that, that is a concern for me, that if you are going to use coercion, you should have some pretty good ideas about how you're going to use it, how you're going to measure it, and how you're going to monitor it. And again, I would say the regular standard of human dignity is uh, a very useful one. This is Frederick Douglass, a uh, former slave, uh, one of his many statements, but he was speaking for the 4th of July in 1852. It's actually the 5th of July that uh, he makes his speech. Um, but in it, he says, you are man and so am I. God created both and made us separate beings. That's a very, very powerful statement. That is the statement of the modern liberal order. And my concern is that as we try to extend coercion to do some of these other sorts of things, you'll have a measuring problem, you'll have a monitoring problem, it will, could well be capture of the uh, coercive agencies that would be carrying this out. Economists call this uh, rent-seeking. Uh, take an example of something in which there's general agreement that it's probably a function of the state. I certainly am on board with it as a function of the state, namely uh, tax-supporting primary and secondary education. Okay, now that's a pretty straightforward one. There's almost universal agreement to it. Some of my very anarchist friends would say no, but uh, generally we would say it's okay to tax ourselves to make sure that everybody has education. Um, so it's straightforward. We kind of know what we want. Um, look at big cities. There has been a huge capture problem. Go to New York. Uh, to Chicago, where I lived for 25 years, or at the suburbs, uh, to Los Angeles, to San Francisco. I just saw something this last week. Baltimore spends $21,000 per year per student, and there's almost none of their schools meet on what you'd call a minimal reading level. So even in something like that, with general agreement, uh, there's all sorts of issues there. Um, 
I could talk about the U.S. sugar subsidy. I mean, I'll skip that one since maybe you like it because it keeps it makes your price of sugar higher. So maybe you're not as addictive uh, to sugar. World price of sugar is about half the uh, price in the U.S. Uh, we've had since uh, 1837. It was revised again in 1981. A pretty substantial sugar subsidy that makes sure that sugar in the U.S. Uh, is more expensive. And what it means is there's about 4,500 farms that are major sugar producers, and the subsidy is about $700,000 per farm for their sugar subsidy. And it comes from what we call concentrated, in, uh, concentrated benefits and uh, diffuse costs. OK, the modern liberal order. It is a coercive order. It is also a moral order. It's built upon a very important concept of political economy, namely universal human dignity. And I would argue that attempts to expand the enforced moral dimensions of the modern liberal order by ex extending, expanding coercion puts that order at risk, that it is not an appropriate way to go about working on these sorts of problems. Now, I should be clear that it may not be the modern liberal order is going to make it. It could well be that these problems that they have laid out, and I'm concerned about almost all of those seem to me to be real problems, uh, will bring down the modern liberal order. Mondays and Wednesdays and Fridays, I'm pretty optimistic about the modern liberal order. Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, I'm more pessimistic about the modern liberal order. And Sundays, uh, I try not to think about it. But, <laughs> This is not a statement that if we just leave everything alone, it's going to be great because the modern liberal order has built in these checks and balances. I think it needs uh, a sense of uh, the moral being, what goes on there. But I would say that the modern liberal order, uh, but the non-liberal order, uh, is even more dangerous. So, OK, that is it. And Noah? You are in charge of questions, right? OK. Um, so we'll open it up to questions. Um, raise your hand, and I'll try my best to. There surely were some, enough provocative statements in there. To, uh, here, you got one right over there. Here, he's coming with a mic. So at the end of your talk, you said that the non-liberal order is more alarming or scary to you than the current liberal order, correct? Well, in terms of, I think so, yeah. Mm -hmm. So why is that? Well, because I see these threats as being very real and being fairly attractive to people. Uh, it's taken me a long time to try to figure out, so what are, what are they saying? And I've spent... Uh, uh, since Professor Estelle invited me to come several months ago, she wanted to know what I wanted to lecture about. I said, well, I think this might be an issue. So I went and bought all the books and read them, trying to figure out, okay, what, what is that? And it just seems to me that they have a, um, uh, a somewhat naive view of politics and coercion. And I keep reading and say, okay, but what do you want to do about coercion? What do you want to do about coercion? And I just view the limits on coercion as a, in a sense, a historical anomaly. You look throughout history, and limits on coercion are pretty unusual. The main limits on coercion has been, well, your neighbor might attack you and take away your ability to coerce. So I would argue the, uh, the coming of the modern liberal order around 1800 is a dramatic change in the structure of societies and the ability of individuals to focus on and live their lives. And so I do see this as a different sort of a threat. There's been other sorts of threats, but this is one that just seems to kind of have come along in the last 15 or 20 years. And so I need something to think about. So this is something that I'm thinking about. And it may not be a concern. You know, it may not be an issue. Maybe these people's ideas have never uh, you know, crossed uh, your mind or made you think that that's, that is uh, an issue at all. I thought I could get that off the screen, but I didn't here. Yes? <laughs> you want to 
guys mind passing that down? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so maybe kind of a counterpoint, at least what I'm thinking about from your, your speak today, uh, speaking today. You brought up slavery a lot in the mm -hmm. discussion today. And there was definitely uses of coercion to limit or eventually eliminate the institution of slavery right. within most liberal forms of uh, governments, or at least in this modern liberal form of government that you've been talking about. Is that not itself an argument for more coercion? Because of that, we're able to uh, get rid of this moral issue within our society? Well, it's sure, it was the, certainly, you're right. It was, I would call it, the correct application of coercion, because you had to go around to people and say, you can't own other people. And so I think you know, a society without coercion is, could be a pretty dismal place, because then you're talking about the rule of the powerful. So yes, I, I would agree with you. Ending slavery, I mean, slavery was built on coercion. It was built on your ability to coerce other people uh, to be uh, at your beck and call. And ending slavery was required coercion to take those rights away from people. Uh, so yes, it was. I am not talking about a non-coercive society. I'm talking about a society with coercion primarily focused on some fundamental principles of universal human dignity. And that's what, for a long-term economic historian, is, is what I think is crucial. If you go back to the North Wallace and Weingast argument, they would say about 25 countries and 15% of the world is uh, contained in what they think of as their open access order or their modern liberal order. I think maybe a little pessimistic, but basically it's still an unusual sort of a phenomena. You know? And think about efforts at migration around the world. Most of the efforts at migration are coming from non-liberal orders to liberal orders, and people want to come, sometimes for the economic advantages, but sometimes for the freedom. Um, no. Now, well, there's a couple up here. Do you think the future of modern liberalism sort of relies on a shared moral code so that we can continue to, I guess, for lack of better words, correctly enforce coercion? Mm -hmm. It does, yeah. There has to be at least some basic shared moral code. And that's one of the issues, say, with the secularization of societies. Do we maintain that? modern, do we maintain that shared moral code? Um, it's, there's enough that's attractive to it. I mean, that people, you know, regardless of religious background, seem to want to buy into it. Now, is that enough to maintain long-term stability? Um, I don't know. But, but the appeals to, to universal dignity have moral weight. I mean, they basically do. And so, in the world today, if you can say uh, that you know you that is a person, and you're violating their their dignity, that's a very powerful argument, and it has been one that people responded to. It took the U.S. you know it, with Jim Crow laws, all it took a long time for us to get to move to where we are today, but it was primarily because of the power of the moral argument. And I see people like Martin Luther King as instrumental because they were willing to make the argument and make it in a very costly but very but peaceful way. Say, you know, you can, you can gas us, you can hose us, you can beat up on us, but we're going to make that claim. And eventually that claim uh, you know, led to civil rights legislation, led to a change in basic ideology. I don't know if it's captured everybody or not. But moral claims have an interesting have interesting power, and that claim, I think, I would hope, that now that it has been articulated and then worked out, that it will have or it will continue to have appeal uh, to people. Yeah. 
So your comment about immigration from non-liberal states mm-hmm. to liberal states made me think like, do you see a world in which we can have a modern liberal system inside of a non-democratic political government? It's feasible, um, but I'm not sure it's stable. Uh, I can see in a non-democratic government uh, the, the people in power actually choosing a modern liberal state for a period of time. Usually what happens in that situation is those people in power find that something is impinging upon their power and therefore they want to uh, move away from the kind of the rules of the of the modern liberal order. So I don't I, could, I see that as a possibility, but I don't see that as a long term situation. And you notice when I talk about the modern liberal order, I didn't call them democratic because to start with they were not strongly democratic, although they were moving in that direction. Um, you know, and say you know it depends on what we mean by democracy, but the U.S. women couldn't vote for a long period of time. Uh, so, uh, but there certainly is, in order to maintain the modern liberal order, uh, you need a couple of things. You need um, belief in the ideology of, uh, of human dignity. Uh, and then secondly, you need people to have a, a means to express that. And I would just say, historically, it's been very difficult for people in power uh, to maintain the modern liberal order um, over a period of time. Uh, so democracy should be a check on, you know, it should be an important facet, facet of the modern liberal order. Uh, pure democracy has problems with that in that people, I like a constitutional democracy. It's kind of where I, where I come down in terms of the, the political systems there. Could we get, I think we have time for one more. I've got time for lots more, but you may not. (laughs) Ah, Steve has got one here. Okay, if if you'll permit me. uh, One of the things that these, uh, this sort of new brand of conservatives want to do, I think, is to enforce uh, moral rules that mm-hmm. we're not currently enforcing. Mm-hmm. And I'm having a hard time putting that into your, maybe that's like a separate issue from what you were talking about here today, because it looks like you're more concerned with their conception of using the state in economic life. But um, do you think there's a similar kind of problem with um, with folks wanting to pass stricter laws against pornography or something of the sort, which I think would be a pretty high priority for most of the folks in this group. Yeah, yeah. There, there's a few moral rules that seem to me, to, you know, the evidence would be, I mean, the whole question of drug legalization is one that it doesn't seem to me that that one falls out straightforwardly, and the same with pornography. No, yeah, yeah I would say moral rules are really in there, uh, in their thing, and I, it is true that when they talk about those things, they talk... The American Compass mostly focuses on economics. Uh, Deneen, uh, um, you know, uh, Vermeule, others. Vermeule wants to go back to what he thinks. He is not an originalist in terms of the Constitution. He wants to go back before that to traditional rules. So there certainly are a few areas like that uh, that it seems to me that we've got to work that one through. One of the areas that um, I think you know, maybe uh, that I think about possibility for coercion um, is um, the whole issue of uh, kind of choosing your children with uh, uh, IVF, uh, you know, virtual fertilization. We're getting to the point that people now can kind of decide much more about what they want in terms of, you know, the size of their children, their background. I mean, so I just think that that's that, that we're now getting in areas that tech, so there may be some technological areas like that. And I would say the drug legalization one. I thought the evidence was pretty good about you know widespread drug legalization would solve a lot of problems. I'm less convinced of that now. So there's so there are there are some of those areas, and there's is religion, but there's this interesting. Their last statement says. In, the, in communities that are Christian, 
it's okay to have a Christian set of rules. Now, I never, I'm not sure, <laughs> I can't figure out what that means particularly, but they, they would say, and a group, a group of the people that I'm talking about are what are called Catholic integralists, uh, and Kenneth Valier, a philosophy professor at, ben Ro uh, at Bowling Green, has written a book about the Catholic integralist, because there is this sense in which you're trying to integrate it into lots of life. But yeah, I apologize for making it sound like it is just economics, because they really are talking about tradition uh, and enforcing, but I, I, um, I must say that most of the specifics come out to be economics, even though there is a pretty wide dis uh, discussion of we need to get back to our traditional mores. And I don't know if they just haven't got that far or if you start talking about it and it becomes too awkward, but I, uh, um, there are lots of questions there about what does it mean for us, because they would, among quite a few of them, there is the feeling that we want a Christian America. And so that's, and I'm not sure what that means. Would you all join me in thanking Dr. Hill? <laughs> Thank you.